So this is the capstone proposal I presented last week at the College of Public Health at UAMS. For my capstone project, I propose to tell the story of one group's experience of the relationship between an organization and the individuals they serve, and to describe the 21st century public health leadership and decision-making implications of that experience. An advisory council is a group of people who are supposed to play some role in the decision-making process of an organization. Advisory councils can be made up of leaders, stakeholders, experts, etc. But I'm interested in councils that are made up of people served by the organizations they're advising. Because it's this process that can shape, or at least reflect, the relationship I'm interested in, which is that relationship between people and their organizations, or people and their systems. Here at UAMS, advisory councils that include patients and their family are being formed for patient and care areas. This is part of the Chancellor's campus-wide project called the Patient and Family Centered Care Initiative. Councils formed for that initiative are called Patient and Family Advisory Councils. Well, I'm going to talk about a patient advisory council that began a year ahead of this initiative, and it's now changing to meet the standards of the Chancellor's new initiative. This council's unique history and structure gives us a chance to learn about the advisory council process at UAMS from several perspectives and to examine the forces that shape it, from the opinions and values of the individual members of the council, to the objectives and standards of national institutions, and the perspective of all the managers, administrators, and public health practitioners in the middle. In the next 30 minutes or so, I want to tell you about the public health perspective from which I'll be working. So I'll talk about the assumptions on which this perspective is based, and some of the definitions we'll be using. I'll talk about the literature, the evidence, and other significant perspectives, especially exposure to this DRPH program that influenced this perspective about organizing around health, governing health organizations, and leadership in health. Then I'll talk about how I'm going to apply this perspective in the advisory council process and characterize it as public health practice and leadership that generates practice-based evidence. And I'll tell you how this will produce something that's useful for UAMS and the people they serve, how it will satisfy the DRPH requirements. And finally, I'll ask for your questions and thoughts about this project. The Internal Medicine North Clinic at UAMS is an outpatient clinic for people with chronic illnesses who are underinsured or uninsured. And in 2011, this clinic, which I'll call the North Clinic, created a patient and community advisory council as part of their move to become a patient-centered medical home, recognized by the National Center for Quality Assurance. The physician leading this uh, change at the time said that our primary goal in the clinic is to provide high-quality care to the underinsured of Little Rock. We need to partner with our patients and communities in order to do this. Well, she teamed up with the Office of Community-Based Health at UAMS to create an advisory council for the North Clinic. Three community members and three patients got it started as original members of this council. Well, shortly after this council was formed, Chancellor Ron began a campus-wide patient and family-centered care initiative and created a patient and family-centered leadership team comprised of formal UAMS leaders. This team was based on guidelines of the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. An objective of this team was to establish advisory councils for all the clinical departments, and now they count this North Clinics Council as part of the initiative. Now, there are many individual and institutional forces affecting the North Council, which presents a great opportunity to listen to and engage in conversations about patient centeredness and advisory councils at UAMS. My capstone is going to draw on the words of the North Council members of UAMS employees of the NCQA and the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care to tell the story and share the practice-based evidence generated in the Patient and Community Advisory Council process. But first, let me tell you how I got here and how I'm approaching this work philosophically and academically. Over my 18 years as a nurse in Little Rock, I had a growing interest in the way we talk about health in Arkansas, the language, the terminology, and the channels of communication. And I came to this DRPH program for the chance to get a broader perspective on all that and to learn more about the health system's language. Now, I like the way that public health seemed to promise a systems perspective on and an appreciation for the social context of the idea of health. Here I was exposed to Lawrence Gostin. He's an influential public health lawyer at Georgetown. And Gostin says, distinct tensions exist between civil liberties and public health, and these competing interests form the corpus of public health law. Well, he's making the point that you have to restrict the freedom of individual people if we're to have a healthy public. Now, I found this core assumption that public health is necessarily opposed to individual freedom to be underlying policies of many health-related institutions that we study. And for most of those institutions, the connection between people and their health systems were often unclear. 
an interest in this missing link led me to work with its advisory council, where one clinic at UAMS was looking to reconnect with their patients and community. In the same article that Gostin wrote, he provides a weak straw man argument for another perspective on public health, where public health depends on, emerges from, individual freedom but he dismisses it as simplistic without much of a discussion. So one of the objectives of my capstone is to talk more about this other perspective and to apply it to public health practice. So let's talk about public health practice for a minute. In the 20th century, public health practice is credited with protecting citizens from organic threats like malaria, yellow fever, tuberculosis, and so on. For the most part, mechanistic, adversarial, and or hierarchical systems were used as tools to fight these organic environmental threats. And they were used exactly because that type of organizing is good for building the kind of structures that can block or kill living organisms. During that time, the average lifespan rose from in the 30s to in the 70s, which served to reinforce this approach to health. Terminology used in much of our health system today is still that of adversity, hierarchy, and command and control. You hear things like campaigns, champion, program, fight, compliance, protect, care for, it's the law, and so on. Now this approach and the success attributed to it haven't been without skeptics, and some would argue that today's public health problems are externalities, you know, unintended consequences of that 20th century approach. Now I think that's a potentially constructive discussion to have, but it might get us off track today, and in some ways it doesn't matter. The reason I bring it up though is that regardless of their origin, the public health challenges of the 21st century are different from those met in the 1900s. For decades, healthcare needs of Americans have been shifting from acute episodic care and towards care for chronic conditions. And to foster that kind of collaborative care and strong patient provider relationships that people with chronic illness need, the Future of Ma Family Medicine Report of 2004 called for a new model of practice that's patient centered. Other current public health priorities also seem to call for reestablishing or strengthening the connection between health systems and people. Health literacy, for the most part, has been defined as the ability of an ordinary member of the public to understand and use health information. Sometimes they say it's the ability to navigate the health system. Well, we're, we're now beginning to talk about this as a manifestation of the weakening connection between the health system and the public, a sign that the system, as a tool, is losing its usefulness and relevance to the issues facing the public that it was created to serve. Health disparities can be seen as a manifestation of a system that works for the few people who design, govern, and conform to it, while not be benefiting the rest of society so much. And to address these problems, we can't rely on the tools we use to command and control the creation of structures to isolate or eradicate living organisms, like bugs, germs, and worms. We need structures that strengthen living organisms, strengthen human beings, and strengthen them in their individual environment. Dr. Mays and Halverson have written, that if we're going to solve problems as complex as obesity and chronic disease, we must have an infrastructure that links public health agencies to other components of the health system. And this project is about linking to the most important component of the health system, the individual people who comprise the public. Now, health is not the only place where the limits of the usefulness of closed hierarchical systems are being found. Through system science, we're beginning to see the limits of traditional scientific notions like Increasing levels of control over nature will improve our quality of life. And one that's important to this project about public health practice, the idea that the role of scientists, technology, and leaders is to protect and control the future for people. You know, even in philosophy, some prominent scholars are saying that while philosophizing may be helpful for you know, a helpful tool for people in solving some problems, a distinct and rigidly bound discipline of philosophy is not so helpful. In physics, Newtonian ideas are being replaced by ideas of relativity, quantum physics, and chaos theory. And these all point to a life and a world as something more complex, dynamic, and unpredictable than we had thought. In sociology, biology, and many other disciplines, scientists have been finding ecological models, you know, systems models, more helpful than reductions models for talking about the complex relationships that affect health. Think about cancer, for example. Along with all this, communication technology is flattening traditional power structures that are based on information. More people in the public have access to health information than ever before, and we're seeing tools are being created to help people command that information for their own health. And this is not a new idea. This is not my idea. 
It's an idea that's been around for a long time. And I believe at least some version of this idea is behind the fact that we have an Office of Community-Based Public Health at the college. It's, it's why there's a hometown health initiative at the health department. Uh, there's a tri-county rural health network in southeast Arkansas that's built by and depends on community members. And there's a, a translational research institute at AUAMS. It's why, there's, it's why there's more of these tools every day, like accountable care, patient-centeredness, uh, community health workers, community advisory boards, you know, all these things, all this literature from diverse scientific disciplines, including public health, presents to me a pattern of power shifting away from institutions and towards people. Now, that's a 10,000-foot perspective, and that's important, but I intend to look at, least, look at at least one of these tools from the perspective of the individual people involved to discover how patient-centeredness looks to them. Patient advisory councils are part of an attempt by UAMS to see the medical care they provide through their patient's eyes. Now, each leadership team meeting and patient advisory council meeting begins with a patient story about the process of care and the implications for improving that care. My capstone is the story of the people on the council. How does the process of advising look through their eyes? Just as UAMS expects that the individual patient stories will enrich its perspective on the process of delivering care, we expect that the story of this particular council will enrich it our perspective on the process of patient-centeredness. In the 2006 Journal of Public Health, Lawrence Green calls for someone in public health to absorb, adapt, and apply concepts and methods of system science into public health. He specifically calls for more practice-based evidence to complement evidence-based practice, which dominates our approach to health now. Now, evidence-based practice is a systematic approach to problem solving that favors tools like hierarchical power structures, guidelines, algorithms, and decision trees. And we tend to like our sets of evidence presented as templates, like how-to, best practices, and authoritative books. Practice requires more than matching solutions to problems, though. To a varying degree, practitioners continually apply, evaluate, amend, and create theories and practice, or theories and use. They're accumulating their own set of contextualized practice-based evidence on which they make their decisions day to day. And that kind of practice level decision making is what will determine how patient and family centeredness looks at UAMS. Now, members of the advisory council and staff from the North Clinic have been practicing a form of patient centeredness for over a year now. In my capstone, we'll share that experience in the form of a video documentary and a paper as part of our own reflection and as a test of the transferability of the practice based evidence we generate. My capstone is a reflective practice approach to generating practice-based evidence, in this case, around the advisory council process at UAMS. Now, reflective practice is a process where the practitioners objectify and critically analyze their own practices, ideas, and assumptions about institutions while they're in the process. The point is to generate evidence from the ground up that's going to complement the evidence-based guide, evidence guidelines that come down about how to do a council and what patient-centeredness is all about. Now let me share my specific aims. And these are the details about how I'll do this over the next few months. Here's a list of my specific aims. We'll come back to these in more detail in a minute, but I just want to read them off and give you an idea of where I'm headed. The first of my specific aims is to, is to describe a perspective on organizing around health where the health of a population depends on the autonomy of its individuals. As we tell this story about councils from every individual's perspective, this will be my perspective. Secondly, in the form of a video documentary and a written document, I'll describe the advisory council process in the terms of the participants in the process. Third, I'll describe the council process in terms of institutions like NCQA, uh, the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care, and the UAMS leadership team. Fourth, I'll describe the process by which these different perspectives converge in a unique way to generate practice-based evidence that has implications for organizing patient advisory councils at UAMS. And finally, I'll talk about the implications for leadership in public health in the 21st century. If I meet these aims, I think everybody involved will have a better understanding of the advisory council process, the way we talk about patient-centeredness, and of the implications for the way we practice public health. Now I want to talk about these in more detail. I'm not only an observer in this council process, I'm an active participant. So the first of my specific aims is to describe the individual first perspective on health and public health that I bring to this collaborative project. I draw mostly on traditional public health literature that I've been exposed to in this DRPH program, 
but I'll also draw on the works of other scientific disciplines where there's a growing appreciation for the value of a system's perspective. You know, earlier I mentioned Gosson's assumptions about the relationship between the autonomy of ordinary citizens and the system of public health. How there's a tension between the two, as if they're always seeking balance on a fulcrum. Well, we were also assigned an article by John McKnight. It's called A Community Approach to Public Health. And he gives another perspective on the relationship between health systems and ordinary citizens. He calls it democracy. He says that democracy works on the idea that self-generated, self-appointed, self-defined assemblies of local common people within communities have the power to decide what is a problem, to decide how to solve the problem, and the power to take action to carry out the solution. He called, he called these groups associations and argues that a democratic society is the aggregate of mutually supportive associations of citizens. In other words, an association is a process of free citizens used on the local level to create a democratic society. Democracy depends on the power of its citizens. Now, he says that systems are also created by people to address problems. And here's how McKnight compares associations and systems. Associations depend on the vision, creativity, and freedom of individuals to solve problems. Systems depend on individuals bending their uniqueness to conform to a vision of a solution. Associations magnify the power of an individual for the sake of solving problems. Systems take power from individuals for the sake of solving problems. Furthermore, since each of these tools are use the power of individuals, the capacity for one depends on the other. So McKnight says, as the power of system tools grows, the power of community tools declines. And this almost seems like Gostin's point, that perhaps the key to public health is finding the balance between individual autonomy and the system. But McKnight's not saying that we should balance the need for individual autonomy with the need for a democratic society. He's saying a democratic society results from, emerges from, depends on the autonomy of individuals. And it's McKnight's public health perspective that I'm going to work from in this project. I'm calling it individual first. And here's the gist of it. Public health is not likely to result from a public health system that defines health and tries to get people to conform to that definition of health. Public health results when individuals have the freedom and power to define health and solve their own health problems. Now, my, ca my capstone is not about whether that way of looking at health is right or wrong, better or worse. My capstone is a chance to apply this perspective to the process, to a process here at UAMS to see what it adds to our conversation. In addition to this academic perspective that I've chosen to use, we'll consider the perspectives of the other individuals involved. To characterize the perspectives of the members of the advisory council process, We'll draw on conversations we've had with them using the CDC Partnership Trust Survey, designed originally for the Prevention Research Centers to spark reflection and dialogue around various components of trust, highlighting those considered to be most relevant by the participating partners. Most of the meetings from the Patient Community Advisory Council's first year and a half were audio and or video recorded, so we have those records. Three people employed by UAMS acted as facilitators of a group or facilitators of the group and liaisons between the council members and the clinic. I was one of those and we met sometimes as often as weekly. Those meetings were also recorded. All of these recordings, as well as meeting minutes, agendas, handouts, and other artifacts in the process, will be used to characterize the perspective of the participants on the process. And this is tricky because per our concept of the individual citizen, each of, the participate, each of these participants brings a unique perspective to the process. To, to address this concern, the individuals will be engaged in the process of reviewing, selecting, and interpreting the artifacts, and in deciding how to present them in a way that best reflects their perception. In fact, these participants have been engaged in the process for more than a year now, and have requested that the product of my capstone project include a video documentary about their experience in their own words. The story will collaborate to tell will be focused on what the participants think is relevant. They've expressed an interest in sharing their experience in a way that will help others engage in the advisory council process at UAMS, and perhaps in other organizations and other settings. The narrative themes to be included in this final product are yet to be chosen. Deciding that and the rest of the details will be part of the work of this group over the next few months. However, your conversations about this process, which is going to comprise the documentary, have been ongoing and some areas of interest have emerged. Council members have expressed interest in talking about the following topics. The purpose and mission, so why are they doing what they're doing? Meeting procedures, 
kind of rules, structures, agenda setting, how do they do all that. Membership, who should be members, how many members, how do you recruit members, those sorts of things. The role in decision making, that is, does this council rubber stamp things, do they provide alternative decisions, do they actually make decisions for the organization. And then the organizational structure of UAMS as it relates to this council. Is the council an outside group? Are they part of the UMS, UAMS structure? Where do they fit? What are the lines of communication? Those sorts of things. Yeah, you know, I told you we did the trust survey. So they have a few things they want to share about the idea of trust. Then accomplishments. You know, what have they accomplished over this first year and a half? And that they can share with other people. And then their lessons learned. What would, what do we learn? And what can other people learn from what we've been through? Now this list is going to change. I know there's a lot of good ideas to be told. I mean, I know there's a lot of good stories to be told along each of these lines, but more discussion about the expectations and feasibility will affect the final product. The guiding principle, though, is to have this be an expression of the council participants. They'll be involved as much as possible so that they're satisfied with the product. While I anticipate the documentary being a standalone document, you know, to serve whatever purpose the council has, it won't constitute the sum of my capstone work. I also need to describe the institutional forces that influence the conversation about patient-centeredness in the councils at UAMS. Not only because of their macro-level influence on local institutions like UAMS, you know, with incentives and penalties and evidence, but also because some of the individuals in the process refer to these institutions as influencing their decisions that they make on a micro-level. So specific aim three is to characterize the perspectives of the institutions. So to do that, I'll consider literature and other artifacts from the National Committee for Quality Assurance. They're the ones that are the national authority on patient-centered medical homes. I'll consider literature and artifacts from the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. They're the authority on patient family centered care, and it's their guidelines that UAMS has looked to, for the most part, in doing patient family centeredness here. I'll also look at UAMS administration and management notes and artifacts. And any other institutions that have a significant influence on this process and on and or on the individual participants in the process. So we'll look at a collection of specific conversations, relationships, policies, and actions of UAMS to characterize the institutional perspectives on solving problems of healthcare delivery through patient centeredness. So the first three aims are presenting the various perspectives on patient centeredness in the advisory process. In fact, the point of this participatory reflective process is to encourage all the individuals involved to reflect critically on their own perspective, their own assumptions, and practice during this process. Beyond simply stating or summarizing these perspectives, though, it's important that I talk about how all of these perspectives converge to create an advisory council process that we experienced here at UAMS, and how this process generates evidence that we can apply to our public health practice. So my fourth specific aim, then, is to present the relevance of this capstone work to public health by describing how the experience of these people in this process resulted in practice-based evidence that, if less tangible or quantifiable, is at least as important to public health as, a, as the systems generated evidence. I'll talk about how an advisory council can be a mechanism for changing the power structures of an organization in the health system, and, and may lead to a more humane health system that fosters public health and how an individual first perspective can enrich our conversation about organizational change, which we know affects the construction of, of and use of novel participatory mechanisms like these, right? I'll talk about the implications of this evidence for healthcare providers, managers, and administrators, and how it can inform the design of tools to improve quality of care, and also inform strategies for using those tools. I'll also talk about the implications of this work for individual members of the public who are interested in doing something about health and whose actions ultimately define public health. I'll talk about the value of this kind of reflective practice and of system science in closing the academic practice gap in public health and informing the way we educate people practicing public health in the 21st century and also reiterate the relevance of this work to public health leadership. My fifth and final aim then is to demonstrate that I practice public health leadership in this process. The public health perspective I've employed here suggests that there are limits to the usefulness of systems as tools. I shared evidence of how power seems to be shifting from institutions towards individuals in a lot of the health-related organizations and in a lot of systems of thought. But what about the science of leadership? After all, this is a degree in leadership. The leadership textbook in our organizational behavior class, written by Northhouse, 
as it presents theories of leadership in roughly the sequential order in which they were developed, clearly demonstrates a gradual shift in the concept of leader as it moves from discussing the characteristics and skills of a leader to discussing leadership as more of a didactic process between leaders and followers. You know, we talked about transactional and transformational leadership. Team and group theory have also moved away from looking at members of the group as static role players, as either you know, lead, he's a leader, he's a follower, and they've moved more towards distributive action, where any member may play a leadership role, and that leadership is a situational and transient role available to any member. Now, Drath and others are calling for a new ontology of leadership that radically de-emphasizes, even casts out, the idea of a single person as a leader. Now, the work of a new ontology is beyond the scope of this capstone project, but I'll describe how I intend or how I try to approach this as an individual member of an association, as a public health practitioner in a distributive leadership process, as described by Nick McKnight, and as the servant leader that Northridge suggests in the January 2012 Journal of Public Health will fulfill the promise of public health in the 21st century. Now, this capstone proposal format is set up for me to present this to you like I'm confident and defensive, but I'm not. I'm working on this because it's something I think is fun to do. Not because it's frivolous, but fun exactly because it's important, because it seems to be meaningful. I'm looking forward to your thoughts and questions and advice.